So I believe in Islam because I consider it to be true. And why it's true? Because of the proven evidence that it gives me. Hundreds of miracles. There are authentic miracles. Of, they, they can actually buy a book. 300 authentic miracles of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. My name is Mansoor. What's yours? Kamil. Kamil. Okay. Go ahead. What what, what do um, you have in mind? Yeah, I just well, let's start like super just want to understand what's your what's your evidence for Islam? Like if I were to say to you, why do you believe in Islam? Why why is that? Okay, so why do I believe in Islam and what's the evidence for this belief system? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to give you a short answer first and then I can expand if you wish to make it expand. So I believe in Islam because I consider it to be true. And why it's true? Because of the proven evidence that it gives me. And what sort of proven evidence it gives me? In the concept of God, in the concept of why we're here, in the concept of what's going to happen to me after I die, in the concept of divine guidance from our creator in the concept of prophethood and messengership and the evidence for prophets prophethood all of this is based on solid foundation of proof and evidence which we can go into and that's why I consider it to be fully grounded to be objectively true okay. all right. so, so what so if you were to go into the actual evidence then what sure. is that? So, so for example um, if you were to start with say Islam believes in a creator, okay? We can establish that without a shadow of doubt, there is a creator of this universe. You as a Christian, you know that already, so I don't have to provide any proof for that yeah. because something that we may already have seen the proof for. Yeah. So by the way, I'm, a, I'm like a Christian, but there's a lot of things in Christianity that I don't pretty... No problem, but if, if you wish, I can explain to you yeah. why I consider there's enough evidence and proof yeah. for the existence of a creator and existence of one absolute creator. That, that I'm happy with. I, I don't really have a problem with the existence Absolutely, sure. So let me just start with saying, so about this creator, I did not just speculate and find out, found out who this creator is. Um, we can, obviously we can, but about the concept of this creator, and when we have absolute guidance from this creator comes through revelation. So the revelation is the Quran, and the one who received the revelation is the prophet and the messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So we have evidence of his messengership and prophethood because of the things that he has brought as an evidence for his message. Number one, I can start with, for example, his life and his character. There is no reason to have any doubt in his prophethood because of, we cannot establish any motive for being a imposter, fake, pretending individual. Because anyone who is not a prophet, obviously, is a fraudster. A fraudster must have some motives to say things that I'm a prophet of God, and you do this whatever without motives people don't just do something like that you cannot establish any political motives any material objectives economic objectives um, any social objectives of social reform and so on none of this we can go through in detail each one failing to establish an objective and knowing historically that he is a truthful reliable person testified by his community like at one point at the age of 40 when he went to one of these uh, hills at that time, they didn't have like an, a warning system like you have now on your phone, you will buy critical warning, okay? Something's happening. So they would go on top of the hill and they will call a speaking speak, call like Ya Sabaha, for example, along these lines, shouting along and people will leave their job, their businesses, their studies, whatever. They will all come and gather because they know something is very important going to happen. They need to know what's happening. And when he said, look, if I told you after they've gathered together underneath this hill, there is a army waiting to attack you. Would you believe in me? They said, yes, we will. We have never seen you lying or speaking untruth. So, so that, 
one piece of evidence you're saying because of the character and the life of the prophet, therefore we think that Islam is true. But because no. we can't this is just the, yeah, yeah, what I'm saying yeah, to Muslim. establish his prophethood, so we need to establish his character. Like, would you go to a doctor with a fake certificate to have a heart operation? Yeah, yeah but so you wouldn't. one question on that. Yeah. So even if he, so you can't find any political motives, social motives. No motives whatsoever. He, but he could just be mistaken. He could, he could honestly believe so, what he's so, saying. So you're saying, Thank so he's deluded, yeah. sincerely. Yeah. Okay, good. So we, we, let's, because I haven't gone through and exhaust all of this motives. Yeah, yeah. Let's say none of these motives are actually valid motives. What if he is a sincere individual, deluded sincerely, thinking he's a prophet of God? Yes, we can address that. Here is the problem with the actual what he has brought the Quran. The Quran talks about many things which a sincere, deluded individual would not only bring to say something like this, but impossible for them to bring. For example, I'll give you a few. Like he says, you did not know this before. If I said, look, oh, you don't know what an atom is, what a proton is. Now, how can I assume you don't know? You may be a professor teaching physics. So when the Quran given to him said, you did not know this before, there would have been someone who says, yeah, I knew it. Stories about the ancients and past. And no one came and said, yeah, it's possible. You're totally mistaken because I knew this. So what gives a deluded individual some confidence to have this certainty that no one knows what he's talking about? But well, you'd argue a lot of deluded people with delusions would be convinced of what they're saying, regardless of what other people think. Regardless. So I don't know that that's exactly. No, 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 let me explore this first. Let's say he says, you know what? The Romans have been defeated. You've probably heard this in the nearest land. But they will be soon victorious again. And the word for soon is bid'a'isinin, three to seven years in Arabic language. So these are the two superpowers at that time, the Byzantines and the Persians. So the Byzantines have been defeated by the Persians. That's what the Quran is saying, the Prophet is saying. But he's saying in all these things, they will soon be, they're defeated, but they'll be victorious very soon. Now, can you make a claim as a deluded individual about world politics today, for example, between, we don't have two superpowers today, right? But America is one superpower. Are you going to say, you know what, America will totally become dismantled in three to seven years, for example, and after seven years and still there, nothing happened to it. You, you, to have that confidence in this kind of precise information about future to unfold, it's not something a deluded individual can do. I mean, there are many examples. I gave you only two, right? So, how does a sincere individual, and this exactly because he lived, Quran was delivered in a period of 23 years. So, this thing happened, and then they were victorious again. People rejoiced that day because that the Romans have been again victorious after they were defeated. So, there your point is basically because there were prophecies. Now, I'm saying, how does a sincerely deluded individual have. Okay, so good. So, now we moving into questions of luck. What are the probabilities of limitations of being lucky? How many times do you need to see something happening and say it's lucky? To give you a, a mathematical um, example from this, if you have one situation and you want to get it right, your chances are one in two or 50-50, half, one over two. If you have two situations, you want to get both of them right, not one right, one wrong, both of them right, it's one over two times one over two is one over four, one quarter. One time to get it right, three times to get it wrong, yeah, out of four. If you have a 20 situations and you want to get it all right, that's one in a million, roughly. Okay, I've done this calculation before. So imagine if the Quran gives you information of this nature where it could be right, could be wrong, out of luck, and you've got 40 examples, okay, 40. That's not one in a million, it's far, far more. It probably goes billion and so on. So the chances of getting it right by coincidence, chance probability, is one chance to get it right and billion chance to get it wrong. And when you then examine a sincere individual who's just guessing, it's guesswork, probability is guesswork, he gets whether it's to do with ancient history, whether it's to do with something in the future, whether it's to do with people's inside their hearts, 
all of the heavy news, you would say the probability of someone guess, guessing is such low that it, it's, it's too fishy to say, oh, he knew what's inside your heart, or he knew the ancient history of the the, um, the Ugaritan individuals from Mari, for example, or the people in Ebla and in, in Syria. It, it diminishes. diminishes. So all of these, these stories that you talk about, those are, you're saying there are a number of or whatever that remain, those were not that made in the Quran, right? That's more like any that. No, I'm saying the Quran, Hadith has hundreds and hundreds. Yeah, yeah. The Quran has so many examples, okay? Yeah. So, there's about 40 things. But if I say, if I bring 40 examples from the Quran, okay. and it, the chances of getting it wrong by guesswork is a billion chance to one, then you would say, you know, it's more reasonable to assert that this is not guesswork. It's more than guesswork. What, what do you make of the, of the fact that if you look at other prophets of God that came before Muhammad, that typically they came with miracles, right? With like very, very kind of obvious miracles, and that I don't think that was the case with Muhammad, right? Why is that? Because that seems to he, be he came with hundreds of miracles, which you are not familiar with, perhaps. That's the issue. Well, but please, today. illustrate us with one miracle, please. Um, so I don't speak to hecklers, if you don't mind. Are you a heckler? No, no, good, no, good. Like He's a heckler, so I would avoid him. If you're a heckler, I would say, miracle. have a nice day. Right? So, there are... It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hundreds of miracles. They are authentic miracles. Of, they, they can actually buy a book. 300 authentic miracles of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's just that people who are studying, you know, um, other religions and so on, they're not reading our resources. But so, okay, so actually, let's go on to the, to the so presumably those come from the Hadith, right? Those miracles. No, I've given examples from the Quran. So what so, kind of miracles are you talking about? I don't, I don't, I've read the Quran. I don't remember reading it specifically. You read the Quran. Okay. Okay, Actually, the, I, I think there's okay. passage where it says, show, like, show us a sign or whatever, and say, no, I'm just, I'm just the, oh, okay. the messenger. So let's address that. I mean, what you've misunderstood is clearly is this. People demand signs mm -hmm. and miracles. People demand, according to their wishes and dictates, what miracles they want. This never happens. God never gives people miracles what they demand. In Christianity, Jesus was demanded so many things. He says, no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. Yeah. Nothing will be given. Yeah, yeah. So but it doesn't mean yeah, but, it, it, but it doesn't mean that he didn't do mm -hmm. any yeah, other miracles. I'm asking, yeah, what kind yes. Of, yeah. yeah. So what we're saying is the Quran records splitting of the moon. And it says when they see what either are, when they see, they say this is magic. So they relegated miracles of the prophets and equates them with the you know fallacy of equivocation. This is magic because they could not rationally, intellectually explain it. They say, Oh, he's a magician. But the Quran says he's not capable of magic. This is not a book of poetry or magic, neither is he capable of. Okay? So all your idea of all this magic is, is you know that it's, you know, you're just trying to have an excuse. So the splitting of the moon, the Quran in one of these chapters says, you know, how does this surah start? Anyone remember? Yeah. The hour is drawn near and the moon is split. And then the next ayah, whenever they see an evidence, an ayah, a miracle, they become what? Uh, they, what's it called? They reject it. Okay? And they say, and they say, next, next ayah, Sihrun Mustamir, a magic which is perpetual and so on. Okay? So the splitting of the moon. Concretely, what does that mean? Though? Hmm? The splitting of the river. So, so a miracle, we're talking about miracles which are localized, miracles which are universalized. That miracle was a miracle that the people who witnessed them was a miracle for them. For example, I know and I believe Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, split the sea with his staff and he walked. But no one can prove it now because I wasn't there. If I was there, I would have seen it with my own eyes. People who witnessed it with their own eyes, it wasn't evident against them. Evidence against these people who were contemporary witnessing. So the people who witnessed and saw the moon split, it wasn't evidence against them. And if they disbelieve and do not accept Islam, seeing that evidence, they will be the dualists of hellfire. Because they rejected an evidence which are obviously meant for them clearly um, without any ambiguity. Well, yeah, I don't know that. Wait, the splitting of the moon doesn't really 
really speak to me as like it doesn't sound as strong a miracle as some of the other. So if you if you were there, so if you were there at the time of Prophet Muhammad and you saw the moon split, you would say, ah, I can do it. He can do it. She can do it. Well, I think, but what do you mean by moon split? Because it could be two parts. In, yeah, but the way split means the, the imagine now. Thing. Imagine now this is one one moon splits into two like this. So you're saying two moons? No, half so, half. It's split. Whether it's a half in the middle doesn't matter. It's split it into two. They can clearly see split in two halves. So that is something that they knew. They're magicians at that time. The best of them, the the, the the most powerful of them, they couldn't do. So it was an evidence against them. So Quran mentions this miracle. So it was a testimony of a di divine testimony of proof of Prophet Muhammad and prophethood at that time. You and I, you might say, I was in there. How would I know? And that's where the the perpetual miracle of the Quran comes in, where the Quran says, if you think it's not from Quran, if you have any doubt, then produce a surah-like into it. If you want to do 10 chapters, 10 yes, surah, that, you can do 10 surahs or a whole book. What does, what does that actually mean? Because I've read that a lot and I don't really yeah. think because I don't speak Arabic. So sure, sure. I'll, I'll try to explain yeah. uh, as briefly and, and simply as possible. So the Quran came in the language of the Arabs. Okay. So Arab, uh, when Arabs speak, they have speech of different types, prose, poetry, sayings of the soothsayers, and so on, right? These are different types of poetry. Quran came in none of those styles. It is neither prose, neither poetry, nor the sayings of the Quran, right? The soothsayers. In its stylistic, it is something totally unique. It's not something that they were able to speak like the Quran. For example, I'm speaking to you in the English language, making sure I'm not making any grammatical mistakes. For example, I say, I is speaking, or do I say, I am speaking? I am speaking. I don't say, I is speaking. You say, what can we? That will be a colloquial someone who hasn't gone and learned about grammar. You know, you know some people do that, okay? Um, Quran came, and the people at that time, they were, why, why was this miracle in this way, if you think about it? We need to go historically what happened. How does God give miracles so that people have no evidence, or hujja, we say, no um, excuse against the prophet and messenger? At each time, people may be proficient in something. At the time of Christ, we believe, there are people who are very good in magic, magic and so on and so forth. Medicine, medicine, medicine correct. But when Jesus, Isa al Islam came, and he just, the blind got cured. Leprosy, cured. Someone dead, wakes up, walks. No doctor or physician at that time would say, Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, is a very, very talented doctor. They would say, that's beyond our medicines and our expertise. So when he did this, that was an evidence against them. The community were proficient in them. So if they didn't believe in Christ and his message, and they die in disbelief, they'll go to hell. Because God's judgment is against those who reject knowing the truth. And that truth was established. At the time of Moses, peace be upon him, magician, you know about Pharaoh and his court and magic and how he came and when he threw his staff and he totally dismantled everything. So when in Arab community, the pre-Islamic Arab community, when Prophet Muhammad Islam was there raised among them, they were very good in poetry. They would compose poetry. In fact, two things they were very delighted of in the birth of. Birth of a male child and the composition of a good poetry. The best poetry poem, they will hang it on the wall of the Kaaba. You know the Kaaba that we do pilgrimage? It's called Mu'allaqat because it's hanging. Of course, the longer it stays, the more better a poem and so on and so forth. So when he came, he knew that these people are so, you know, well-versed and they knew that he's not someone who's literate because he did not go and learn anywhere in any schools or seminaries or anything in which he's learning the art of speech and eloquence and so on and so forth. So when he came with the Quran, what did the best of them say? This is not the statement of a human being. So when the Quran challenged them, when they said, well, don't you believe in it then? Bring something like it. They were not able to compose. So we are talking about the stylistic composition of it. There are objective books, works written by academic professors on this very subject 
in terms of how this is objective. Because people think, oh, it's all about beauty and eloquence, it's objective. But it's not. Because when we talk about stylistics of a language, it's all objective. Do you start with a no sentence with a noun or a verb or the preposition? Where do you construct this in this way? For example, do you use a singular or a dual in this case? Or a plural in this case? All of these compositions. Do you use a verb um, when it could be noun? I mean, it's called master and all. What are they are in English called? Ad ad gerund in English. So, so, yeah, so there are grammatical rules or the rules, principles of eloquence. Shakespeare, when he wrote his sonnet, has a particular composition. Is it? You're saying, so basically you're saying because the Quran is a written when the Quran challenges people to imitate its style and no one was able to do it then, no one is able to do it now, and no one is able to... What does that mean? Like, what would that... Because that sounds like a very, very, very uh, difficult test. Like, there's no test that you say, oh, what's like the Quran or not? Oh, it is very easy. How, how would you describe that? If I say bring a tripod like this one, if you bring... This is the tripod. Yeah, but what's for the Quran? So is I, I will explain, I will explain. Yes. Let's understand what is Quran says bring something like it. Bring a, like a tripod like it and you bring this. Does it look like a tripod? Does it have three legs? No. So first we need to understand what exactly is the Quran. So the Quran, if you con if you analyze the linguistic stylistics of the Quran, you will see that the Quran employs something called like out of many things, iltifat, grammatical shift for rhetorical purposes, in which it it takes you like for example it says like look how you know do you see how these people they are in the boat and the wind comes in the ship and the wind comes and they're drowning and they and then you say oh god save us did you even notice the subtle difference between them to you so from a third person to a second person and so on this kind of shift produces a dramatic effect on the listener and so on the quran introduces this when this was not known to the arabic uh, corpus of literature this is one example out of hundreds sort of objective way. In the Quran as well, it says one of the very first works that were written. No, no, Quran is the first, you can say, a book, but they had poetry, hundreds and hundreds yeah, of them. But, but uh, I don't know, it just strikes me as like, just a novel style of writing doesn't strike me as like a miracle in the same way, like parting the seas. Yeah, it's but why, 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 would, why would you not be able to imitate, say, Shakespeare? Oh. AI could do it. Yeah. But I feel like, for instance, I don't know, if you were to take GPT and ask it, Oh, right. I did. In the style of Quran, it probably would be able to come up with something. To I actually did a video on this. Oh, yeah? yeah? Okay. I recommend you watch that oh, video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I go into so much detail, I'll, okay. I'll tell you which one. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it'll be very interesting for you to uh, look into it. Muhammad Khan, visiting from US. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. So if I, if I show you. I want to talk about some other things. Yeah, yeah. You, I, you're very welcome to um, to look at this yeah, and you'll I'm be. super interesting though, because I study linguistics. So that's yeah, yeah. something that I, I really am latch onto. But Immediately in the Quran, okay. Chat GPT, right? Yeah. You can find it in the other ways. Yeah. It's just a five months ago. Huh? Okay, cool. okay. And okay, so I tried to give as yeah. much easiness to Chat GPT to actually say, okay, maybe you can do it. Okay, this is all the objective criteria. And you'll see at the end, you know, right. you know how it did. Let's, okay, let's, let's leave that. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is, if Chat GPT cannot do it because it's a linguistic model, if human beings cannot not do it, what is restricting human beings to produce something like it? You expect Beethoven, you expect any kind of literature, art, should be imitable. And that's what our intuition yeah. says we can. I, yeah, no, no. Let's say no, 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 no. It's, it's not, it's not. This is one of the yeah, 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 but I, yeah, biggest, yeah. no, no, I will park it, but what I want to say is, this is one of the evidence for the Quran being from God yeah, according I, to the Quran. That, personally, if I can understand, right. it would speak so to me. Look into that. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll the other, other example the Quran says in terms of so these these, these are we're talking about the falsification tests okay so they are not giving positive proof but giving you falsifying um, methodologies in which you can falsify it's not from God do you expect if a book is not from God and it talks about so many different things about nature natural world about science about history about the future that they will get mis make mistakes a book which is not from God by human being at any time period and if they talk about all of these disciplines, you would expect them to make mistakes because their knowledge is only limited to how much they know then. 
the Quran actually says to the people, have you not pondered the Quran with care? If it wasn't from God, you'd find there in many discrepancies, yeah. many contradictions. Well, I think on that, I'm not, I'm not a specialist by any means, but there's one thing that I read about this, for instance, it describes uh, the creation of life, right? The embryo and the and And if I'm not mistaken, there's a part in which it says, basically, bone comes fast, then flesh, or something like that. Basically, it describes the whole process, but it, it misses one of the seven, the one of the properly representing what we know, how the embryo what do, what do we know in the embryonic development? I mean, I studied this subject over many, many years, and then someone came along and started talking about it, and then this is on the internet, got... No, 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 what I'm saying is, I'm more than willing to go as much detail as you want, and I will tell you, and I, I mean, this is recorded, I read on otherwise. I'm challenging even P.Z. Myers, who was involved in this saga, between our brothers Abnan Rashid and Hamza Zorsis, when they went to the Atheist Convention in Scotland, right? I'm challenging any embryologist and every development biologist to show us in the development processes of an embryo, where is the precursors of bones and muscles, which precedes which? Where? Give, give me the literature, I can give you the opposite. I can tell you why the precursors of bones comes first and then the muscles develop. I can give you examples from the metals cartilage in the development biology literature. I want to see where is the evidence. All you have is someone called Captain Disguise in, in the internet, which in a rebuttal much about nothing, a paper against Hamza sources, and they think they go, they've, they've debunked embryology. I've been speaking about embryology in this park from the 90s. And I've debated medical doctors on this park on the very ladder here. He doesn't come here anymore. I'm more than willing to talk about this topic and demonstrate to you how the Quran is not only accurate, but it doesn't go in line with, excuse me, in line with the Greek Aristotelian doctors or you know, um, Galen's or, 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 and so on and so forth. I mean, actually, when I was asking you at the beginning, uh, what's your evidence? With, like, I, I don't actually don't necessarily dispute that Islam is a truth. I think one, I think one of the questions, there's other things that you want to talk about in this particular topic, because I had some other questions that I wanted to bring on. Sure. So, just want to wrap this up. Islam provides its own falsification test to make it false for people, to make it easy, because that seems to be a, a rational position to have for people who are critical minded. There you go. If you don't want to believe in Islam, if you don't believe in it because you want something, that must be a way to falsify. So, you had example of uh, contradictions, bring a chapter like it, and I gave you one example out of a few in which someone could easily say, I knew it. Yeah, another example is a person called Abu Lahab, Quran says he's going to go to hellfire, and so would his wife, and he lived for more than 10 years after that. He could have simply said, I believe in Islam, and he made Islam false. So, there are evidences where you can try to falsify it, and if you cannot, then you have to ask critically why so. And of course, there are positive affirmatory uh, examples where the Quran can be shown that it has to be from God, it cannot be from your else. I think there's some other stuff that I want to look into and I'll come back to. No but problem. I wanted to, to move on. I had another question. So, if you let's say you know, Islam is a revelation from God, so there's Islam, and then there's, there's the other religion of the book, right? Christianity. So, why is it, from my understanding, when I, I read the Quran, there's, a, there's several passages, there's one story in particular that says, why, why were you given different parts? And God says, um, you know, the, the reason why is because we, I, we wanted you to uh, to essentially follow each path, and then in the afterlife, you will be told which path was actually the correct one, and you will be told what the, what the, um, the, the, true, the truth is. So the fact that there's like basically several roads to Rome, and that each of these paths are equally valid in different ways, so that would make Islam equally valid, the Judaism equally valid, the Christianity as valid paths to God. And so I'd like to understand why would Islam be the only true path to God? Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. So firstly, if somebody assumes that this is what Islam says, that there are many paths to God, equally valid, from the Islamic perspective, this is false. Islam says there's only one path to God. Okay? And one path to God that has been interpreted in multiple no, 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 no. There have always been one path to God. And Islam, Islam with Prophet Muhammad Islam, is the finality and completion and perfection of that path. Because each Prophet... I mean, find the Surah, I mean... Sure. It is, um, it is Al Maida. So yep. if God has so willed, He would have made you one community. But he wanted to test you through that which He has given you. So race to do good. You will all return to God, and He will make clear to you the matters you have heard about. Yeah. So let's read that. Which ayah is this? Uh, it is um, Al Maida. 
No, no, which which eye out way then? <laughs> okay, it's, 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 it, there's a verse like, in the Quran like that. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that God is having various parts. What he's saying, had God will, he could have made you into one community. But the fact that human beings have been given freedom of yeah, okay, forty-eight. Okay, my, the, that's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it here. My the forty-eight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, look. So let's read the whole verse to understand the context. I'll just read the English for you. It is yet, right? And we have sent down to you, O Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the book, this Quran, in truth, confirming the scripture that came before it, and a Muhaymin and a trustworthy in highness and a witness, meaning a quality control, a guardian over it, over the previous scriptures. Okay? So judge between them by what Allah has revealed and follow not their vain desires, diverging away from the truth that has come to you. To each among you we have prescribed a law and a clear way. If Allah willed, he would have made you one nation, but that he may test you in what he has given you. So strive as in a race in good deeds. The return of you all is to Allah, then he will inform you about that in which you used to defer. Yeah. The Arabic word is Everyone is given a Sharia, you've heard of the Sharia, and a path a Minhaja. So all prophets and messengers, when they came, number one, they came with one religion, way of life called Islam. Pure, sincere submission to the will of God. Because they express what the will of God is by saying God wants you to speak the truth. God wants you not to kill. So I do and I'm not a prohibition. So this... So in my understanding, what you're saying, I think my understanding is that Islam is actually, it is the same for all for Christians, Jews and everything. It's the same thing. And they, so there's like Islam, the actual religion, what we call Islam today, but there's like Islam is like the ultimate submission to God that all Christians, Jews and Muslims apply, adhere to. Is that right? Like, um, okay, I maybe explain and then you understand. So every prophet that came, the message, core message has always been the same, that you should worship none but God. You should follow me because I am now the spokesperson of God to come to give you the laws and regulations, the guidance, the commands and the prohibitions. Okay. Now, every society is not equally in terms of their needs with every other society. Some societies in earlier times, they didn't have any terms, say for example, any say problems of a particular crime. God did not give a law for this community. There's no need to have a law when there is crime is non-existence. So this Sharia I mean, Hajan was specifically for that. For another community, there might be something very rampant, so much of a crime like that. So God, through the prophets and messengers, will give a law. That law would be something in addition to what the other community doesn't have, or something slightly different. Because to them, the need was something different for the society. So each community, even though they had the core message of the same, that there is a heaven and hell, that there is one God that you're supposed to worship. But you need, in terms of how you deal in your life, how you fulfill your obligations to God and the fellow creation, there might be some differences in terms of the laws and regulations. Each one had their differences because of all the social differences between themselves and their time frame and so on. The Quran says, look, we have sent to the Prophet, we have sent you in truth this book, which is now going to be a quality control over it. So whatever it had or has in its adulterated form or its truth form, Quran will testify of its truthfulness and its falsify of its falsehood. It's a political control. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean though, that their path is still valid. What the Quran is doing now, Quran is abrogating all of this and saying, this is the revelation that God has sent. Okay. Now the Quran being the final book, follow not their own desires, but follow the Quran that God has given you. This is the quality control of all things that the Quran is going to quality control over. So there are lots of different parts. Either the path that has been adulterated and corrupted, and that's usually what happens. God sent prophets and messengers, people changing it. All 
all human beings in different tribes and nations, God says, they had prophets and warriors. God did not leave a community which he's going to judge without a warner. Quran tells us that he doesn't punish any nation until his sons of warner, and every community had a warner, had a prophet and a messenger. But look at the difference that we see today. So many differences between hundreds and thousands, if not millions of religious ideologies and belief system. So so what, in the well, if you com compare that, the differences, right? So what the Quran is saying, these things people have adulterated and corrupted. Some may be totally man-made. Others, originally divine, but people corrupted it. The Quran has now come to quality control over it, and this is the final book that everyone should follow. So even though there was for every people, there was different manhaj of half and a sharia or law, at that time, those who followed those paths and the sharia, I'm not going to answer that question. If a person at the time of Moses, I'm going to ask you, I'm Muslim? Yes. Alhamdulillah. At the time of Prophet Musa Islam, if people followed the path that Prophet Moses brought, would they go to heaven or not? Yes. All agree. Even though what they may have then may be different than what we have now. But any prophet and messenger, whatever they brought and people followed, that's the path to success. But now, when a final prophet comes. To give you an intermediate example, when Christ came to the children of Israel and he said, now follow me. I have the new guidance from God. And if the people of Moses, the Jewish people said, we're not going to listen to you. We will stick to our Torah. Do you think they will have salvation in heaven? I would say no, because they're, dis dis they're disobeying the commands of God through the prophet Jesus. So then, why is it? So, there's this Surah that clearly says, oh, there are several communities. You know, if, if God had willed to make you one community, he could have. And then there are also lots of other references to people in the book. It's rather yeah. saying that. So, so these, there's to me points that the fact that there's at least three communities that are equally. No, no, no. The Quran doesn't say the Quran doesn't say they're equally valid. The Quran says come back to come back. No, the, what Allah is saying, they differed even after the evidence came to them. So people keep on differing, and the people would differ because of the freedom of choice that God has given them. But it is not acceptable for them because they differ. The people will make different parts, different choices. God is saying none of it will be accepted. Whenever a prophet and messenger comes, the only thing that they accepted is what the prophet and messenger has brought. At the time of Christ, at the time, but whoever followed Christ, they're on the right path. Yeah, yeah, but in the Quran, the Quran affirms several times that it confirms the previous revelation, and it also allows you, it puts the people of the book as a separate, it, you know, people of the book are not disbelievers. Right? You, you agree with that? No, no, I don't. The Quran, okay, yeah, says, the Quran, the Quran talks about the people of the book and says, look, those of you who say Jesus is God, Okay, so or God is a trinity, or a, no, 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 I'm going to tell you what the Quran says, right? Then I'll come to your particular belief, because everything is included. <laughs> the Quran, whoever they, they said, they have disbelieved. When Christ came to tell people, worship God, my Lord and your Lord. So whoever in any form, in any shape, or way, worships Christ, either uh, as a God, or a son of God, the first one of creation, part of the trinity, whatever, they've all disbelieved. That's the message of the Quran. It doesn't mean Quran and those is Christianity. The Quran corrects their erroneous belief and tells you God give you a favor by sending prophets and messengers and a book. And if not everyone is the same. But now the prophet has come, messenger has come. You have to follow him. If you don't follow him, it's like you're rejecting all the prophets and messengers of God. At the time of Christ, whoever followed Christ and accepted and believed in him as a messenger of God, they're successful ones. So God does not accept multiplicity of religions, of parts, like in Hindu religion. Religion, for example, like the Quran says very clearly in, in, in the surah you've probably um, also read, where it says, 
Today I perfected my religion. Yeah? Completed my favor upon you. And made Islam as your religion. Al-Yawma. Akmaltu lakum deenukum. Wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati. Wa raditu lakum al-Islam deena. Made Islam as your deen and way of life. No other. And the Quran also says, whoever accepts, chooses any other religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted from them. And in the hereafter, they will be losers. They will be of the losers. So Quran categorically says, Islam is the only path with the final message of Muhammad Islam for the Jews and the Christians and the Noahite people who believe in the most message of Noah. Why, why, is there, why, was there, why was there a need for a new revelation after, the, after Jesus and after Moses? Very good question. Very, no, 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 no. Very good question. It's an excellent question. If you think about the revelation that sent to particular communities in the past, so say the people of uh, the Jewish people, the Jewish community, their message is confined to their community. So that message wouldn't be equally applicable to the people of China, for example, because Chinese people may have other needs and so on and so forth. But the core message about God, about hereafter, about heaven and hell, you should see the convergence and similarities. But it wasn't universalized anyway. Message given to other prophets or other nations or other times, likewise, they're only localized and temporary for their needs. In the wisdom of God, God is going to send a messenger to be universal, who would be a prophet for, to all nations for all times, rather than keep on sending prophets and messengers, because I, I, time would come in the future, like already happened, where mankind would not be isolated communities anymore. Like today, I can speak to someone all around the world, a device in my pocket. I don't need to go to the corners of the earth. I can just physically speak on my phone. So at that time, when you can see when Prophet Muhammad some came, the communities were such in a position to travel and so on. Message, message of Islam spread to one third of the globe within 30 years, if I'm not mistaken, after his Prophet was in the time. So that's why the communication means and resources were available. So the universal message is needed for universality of all people. So I need to be guided even if I'm in Bangladesh, for example, or in, in, in Indonesia or in, in China or in, in anywhere in the world. I need to be gu have guidance from God even if I am a million years later. So what Allah has done is given his complete guidance in this form of complete revelation, the final revelation called the Quran, in which you don't need any reformation to take place because the guidance is completed. Yeah, but that was already the case with Jesus. Jesus' message is universal. Okay, if you think, for example, I mean, let, let's test this idea. What is the best solution for drinking and driving? Do you know how many people get killed on the roads in England? Too many. Any? Too many. How many domestic violence happens under the influence of alcohol? Too many. I work in a hospital, I know it very well. Right? So what is the best solution for all these drink-related problems? Best solution. Not a solution, but the best solution. Drink. Not drink. Okay. So that's, I agree with you. In the message of Jesus Christ, his first miracle was turning water into wine. And they were drinking, consuming. Where is the prohibition? Don't drink at all. There is no prohibition. Well, yeah, but that, I mean, you don't need to not drink either. As in, like, drinking feels if you have, If you're a Christian and you, you read the Bible, it says you can drink. And we know that's the problem. I will drink a little bit and then start drinking, drinking, drinking okay, and commit problems. Okay, so that's why I agree with you. They say, oh, no, no, it doesn't work. No, but there's no prohibition for smoking. Smoking is also illegal. Islam prohibit, we all prohibit anything. No, no, it doesn't have to be Quran. No, no, it doesn't have to be Quran. Quran no, 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 no. What I'm saying is Quran is the foundation, the first um, source of Islamic law. First source of Islamic law. Then comes the Sunnah of the Prophet, right? Let's 
Yeah, no, sure, sure. What I'm saying is, we have within the source of Islamic law that incorporates, and we can make analogical deduction, even if smoking wasn't there, even if, so for example, um, cloning, cloning animals or sheep wasn't there, we can still derive laws. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, let's come back. So on, on the need so, for a final revelation after... Yeah. So, so why Christ could not have completed his guidance, I've given you one example in which the guidance is lacking. There is no guidance. You need a guidance which you agree with, no drinking at all. And the Quran tells you that guidance. So yes, we have that guidance. No, 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 no drinking at all. That's the best solution. Can you get, okay, can you, can you get a better solution? I don't drink, so I... Fine, fine. But what I want to establish is this. Can anyone get a better solution than ours? No drinking at all. Because you need to have self-control. Can you get a better solution than ours? Yes. Better. No, but yeah, but that to me doesn't sound doesn't. Tell him about self control. Do you know what do we mean by solution? Let me give you an example. Brother, brother, one second. You know when a pipe leaks, say in a bathroom, a pipe is leaking and water drips. Now this brother, with the all due respect, he gets a scotch tape and puts it around it. Twenty four hours later, it's still leaking. It was a solution. It was the rest. This brother comes along. He puts a pot underneath it. The water collects. A few hours later, it's all full, overflowing. A solution, not the best. This brother comes along, he's a plumber. He ca oh, one, 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 one second. He cuts the, the leak portion, cuts it, puts a new joint, seals it, that's it. Out of these solutions, this is a solution, this is a solution, this is a solution. Can you get a better solution than this? Okay, so the, the point I make, so in particular the prohibition of events and actually was originally the prohibition of wine specifically and then it was extended to other types of alcohol, right? Because it was behind the, 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 looking at the concept of all wine was uh, prohibiting wine. We are, we are confusing. Uh, so so the, the, the point being that there were some early that still consumed alcohol, so I don't think that... Now anything that befucks your mind. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Khamar, like, khamar, khamar. And that, that's also in the Bible, by the way. Also, but the Bible doesn't it, prohibit. Yeah, yeah. But so, so to come back to the point, it's like, why would you need a revelation? Because so, Christ, Jesus was a prophet of God, yeah? Yes. And his message was universal. No. Well, That's so, the actually, point yeah, we're making. Because his message, look, even in the Bible, okay, let's start with... Anyone can become a Christian, right? Um, that's what you think now. That's what you think, right? Okay, well, right. yeah, let's talk about let, let's, let's look at it scripturally and then use uh, rationality into it. A Samaritan woman came. Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, peace be upon him, was sitting with his disciples. They were conversing something. This woman came and said, begging, heal my daughter. He's not listening. He's not responding. He's not looking into her. She keeps begging, Master, Rabboni, Rabboni, Master, Master, heal my daughter. He's not saying he's concentrating with his disciples. This woman persists on it. The disciples are not as patient as Christ. This is all, send her away, master, send her away. Like they're irritated. Just, you know, and then she keeps pleading. Jesus said, what does he say? Come, let me heal your daughter. What does he say? There are about three, four steps. Do you know where the reference is? Where? I don't know the reference. Okay, let me find out. It's, it's very important to understand this story because that will tell you the mission Mission, mission of Christ, right? Um, yeah. Oh, oh, oops. I want to bring this first, firstly. To the lost sheep. House. Okay, so here I'll go into um, Bible Hub. Matthew chapter 15, let's go to the chapter. And it starts here. Mm -hmm. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is miserably possessed by a demon. But Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Now this is Jesus' second response. First response was, he didn't... 
ignored her. You would not want to ignore someone who is in need, but he ignored, and we would know why. So this is the second response he's provided. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She was a Canaanite woman. She was not from Israel. Jesus didn't say, I have come to the whole world. He said, I only came to a specific portion of the Jewish community. Not all of them, the lost ones. That's what even the Christians and Jews would understand. He didn't come to all the Jewish people. He didn't come to the people who were on the right track. He came to the one who were lost, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Not the sheep who are not lost, the lost sheep. Okay, so that's his response. What does the woman say? The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, Lord, help me. She's begging, she said. Okay? But Jesus replied. This is his third response. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. So what is he saying here? That he has no right to give the guidance or this curing thing for her because she... No, I am going to go through each example. Let's understand one by one. First he ignores. Second he says, I didn't come for you. Third he says, it's not even my right to attend to your need of your daughter who's demon possessed. Look, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Dogs here is a metaphorical way of saying someone who was a goyim, non-Jew, yeah. right? So you are a non-Jew, the children whose bread I'm supposed to give, you have no right to have that. What does she do? Yes, Lord, she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So she understands that Jesus wasn't sent for her, for her community. But just look, even literally, if you were to have crumbs that falls over from the master's table, I can pick those crumbs. Indirectly, I can take them some guidance. He says, woman, you, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you desire. Fifth, or fourth or fifth occasion, after her persistence and have faith that this particular individual is going to be a healer, a healer, because the word was spread in the community. There's a healer around who heals the blind, the lepers, and the, the demon possessed, and, and so on and so forth. They're all bringing their, you know, sick individuals to be getting healed. And what do they do after that? Praising God. They don't say, ah, hallelujah, we worship God, God on earth. You'll find nothing in Matthew and Luke and when these descriptions are given. So, this particular event, one second, let's understand, this is the end of that story, right? This particular event gives us a teaching that Jesus, in his own admission, his mission was not universal. It was a specific community within the Jewish people. And even after persistent begging, he makes an exception. So, Jesus, according to the Bible, was not a universal prophet and messenger. If we were to, if we were to, if you were to now look at towards the end of his mission, what does he say? I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear it. But when I go, I will send him, and he will guide you unto all the truth. So, did he give and say everything that he wanted to say? He says, "You are not ready." They're not ready at that time. So his mission was left to be completed by someone who will send after him. The Christians believe, you and I know who they believe, it's the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit hasn't brought any truth about drinking and driving, even today. I think you don't understand it, but I understand. Regardless, but the lady, do you mind saying The lady was, the child was healed. You haven't finished the story. Did you just heal her child? Of course. Yeah. But that wasn't the point. The, the point is exception. mission. So he His mission was not for everyone. He makes an exception and you expect a, a, a prophet and a messenger when someone's begging and begging and begging not to simply simply say, oh, get lost, right? This is this is his mercy. So regardless of what the... Uh, yeah. So do you, do you agree, according to the Bible, according to his own admission, he wasn't a universal prophet and a messenger. If we were to now go and study to give you an example, imagine my dear lady here, a husband, a Christian husband, suddenly became so bad. Bad meaning what? Doesn't commit adultery, doesn't sleep with the other woman. But he comes in and he hits her, punch her eyes and gets her eyes out. He does that every day. She loves him. He's her husband. 
but he keeps on doing that. Breaks her leg and tortures her, but he doesn't commit adultery. It goes on and on and on like this. At one point, she says it's enough. I don't want to be with this man anymore. Can she divorce him? Can you divorce your husband? Bad husband like that, not your current husband, the bad one. Can you get in, can you get another life with another man, which God may have blessed you with? You cannot divorce. So one 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 one. But, one yeah, but let me say. Yeah, go ahead. When someone is drunk, when someone is abusing somebody, you guys don't believe in spirituality, but as Christians, we believe in demons who possess people. Like like when someone is drinking, yeah. he's not only drinking for himself, like I drink for my lunch or my dinner, one glass. Sure. That's fine, I'm Christian. But some people drink, drink, yeah, yeah. So they are possessed in a way. Those drug addicts, those... Uh, so if my husband comes beating me, beating me, beating me, I need to hit the, the spirit behind that person. Keep because, on doing that. Suppose you keep doing that for 10 years. Uh, no, yeah, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll break the spirit. I will pray against the spirit. Because the, it's spirit. So the point I'm making is, in Christianity, there is no ground for divorce except when they commit adultery. Yeah. I know that she knows that well. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is not practical. I mean, why? No, no, no. no what, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, you may agree or disagree. What I'm saying is, in a practical world, we need practical solution for universal people, old people at all times. This is not a practical solution where you just keep on persisting and suffer. In Islam, there is a solution. She can get divorced and then you start another life. So all the time, the, an example I can give, I can give you the alternative in Islam in which Islam provides an alternative universal solution. So I gave you one or two, I think this is sufficient to say Christianity as a package is not universal, cannot be universally applied. That's why you need a universal prophet and messenger. Can I ask you something? Okay, go ahead. Can I ask? If uh, Islam was universal, like Egypt, Iraq, all of these Arab countries, yeah. why they have changed to Islam culture? Why they didn't keep their culture? Why they were not allowed? Like Egypt completely become Islam. Even Somalia, like where I, okay. what, do you mean, what do you mean by culture? I still eat rice. That's my culture. I don't eat fish and chips every day. I mean, well, one second. No, no, when you when you meant so culture, you what do you mean? Because completely they left all the culture, like what? all the languages, their cultures. I mean, like dress and other things. They become Muslims. To give you to give you the example I against it. Djibouti, I come from the Indian subcontinent, I right? And I wear a longi. Do you know what a longi is? Yeah. Yeah. So I wear longi at home. I wear longi when I'm in my country. Why do I wear longi and not trousers all the time? Because I've been brought within this culture. I find it very comfortable. So Islam didn't say, oh, you can't wear a longi anymore. Islam gives a dress code which says it needs to be modest. So if a longi provides modesty, Islam says, yeah, you can carry on with that. So it is not right the way you're explaining that Islam has stripped away from people's culture. No, every country has elements of culture Islam left it because it doesn't go against Islam. Whatever goes against Islam, for example, some people may be worshipping a tree in, in, in Africa. Yeah? And they were Muslims, actually. They didn't even realize that the tree shouldn't be worshipped. And then Islam says, no, you can't do that. You have to leave that cultural practice of worshipping and devoting yourself and paying homage so, to a tree. So to come back to the Christianity the last one, like, so at yeah. the time the Quran was revealed, Christianity was already universal, right? It had already spread beyond that very small tribe and of, at the time of Jesus from when he was when he was alive he didn't have like, disciples from multiple not just Jews anymore that had gone beyond so he was there was something that even if it wasn't really protected, that wasn't his mission anyway if people want to take it he, he, forward yeah, that's people, people. But that's people, people. Did, but people did follow him at the time that was all that became Christianity as we know it at the time the Quran was revealed it does reference the fact that the gospel still exists and it can't be confirmed Okay. Let me address two points here. Yeah. The gospel at the time of the Prophet Islam and Christianity spreading. You see, look, if you have an incomplete guidance, I can send this brother to all over the world and still people have an incomplete guidance. He can reach everywhere, but they would not have a complete guidance. So the mission of Christ was not something that was universal in the first place. It was not meant to be. So even if they didn't, but even 
if they took to the whole every corner of the globe Christianity, Christianity is still incomplete guidance from God because it's not a complete guidance to begin with. So what, how is it incomplete? Like what makes it incomplete? I give you a solution about practicality of a divorce. About I'll give you. I'll, I'll, I'll make it three. I'll make it. I'll make it three. In day-to-day -day life, in marriage, divorce. In about consumption of alcohol and preserving the human mind and intellect. And 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 the other example I'm going to give you is about usury and interest. The whole world is enslaved by usury and interest. Where is the prohibition of usury and interest within your scripture? The whole world. Why do you need a prohibition on usury and interest? Like I don't understand what. Do you that understand? Makes sense. No, because Look, it's not this. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. There are, there are laws in that make that prohibits regardless of the no, religion. No, no. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I will tell you. In the UK, I will tell you. you no, no. I will, I will tell you something. Why would you need a prohibition? If God, if God wants a community, people should be living in this community with some guidance. And one of the guidance is, you know what? Usual interest corrupts people, makes some people greedy and some people oppressed. So no usual interest. This society will thrive in compassion, yeah, rather than greed and oppression. Because usual and interest, what it is like, my brother comes along, he says, you know what? I'm so desperate to repair my house. I don't have money. I only need 1,000 pounds. No one is giving me. What? No, 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 no. I want to give an example. No, no, I want to give you an example to illustrate why we need guidance. He comes to me knowing that I have money. I said, you know what? Okay, 1,000 pounds. Give me 1,700. Now, what have I done? I have exploited his weakness by my greed. Because I know he is weak. He's, he is vulnerable because he needs the money. He needs to repair. He doesn't have anywhere to go to. So out of desperation, he says, okay. Some, that's what people do in banks. Out of desperation, he agrees. But he knows that, okay, that's not a kind heart. That's someone who is very greedy and someone exploiting my weakness and my vulnerability. So what we are saying, usually in interest, Quran declares a war against, is because it is not good for us. And in an Islamic society, when it was in the, Islam was implemented, it thrived. But of course, when Islam was in a political level, I mean, you can disagree. I mean, if you don't, if you don't know anything about Islamic history, of course. But if you knew anything about Islamic history, you'd realize, you'd realize how it was so successful in the world. But when things became all Islam was removed from the political spheres and so on, and people are now, you know, engulfed, you know, inside out.